Law 43. Work on the hearts and minds of others. Judgment. Coercion creates a reaction that will eventually work against you. You must seduce others into wanting to move in your direction. A person you have seduced becomes your loyal pawn, and the way to seduce others is to operate on their individual psychologies and weaknesses. Soften up the resistant by working on their emotions, playing on what they hold dear and what they fear. Ignore the hearts and minds of others, and they will grow to hate you. Transgression of the Law Near the end of the reign of Louis XV, all of France seemed desperate for change. When the king's grandson and chosen successor, the future Louis XVI, married the 15-year-old daughter of the Empress of Austria, the French caught a glimpse of the future that seemed hopeful. The young bride, Marie Antoinette, was beautiful and full of life. She instantly changed the mood of the court, which was rank with Louis XV's debaucheries. Even the common people who had yet to see her talked excitedly of Marie Antoinette. The French had grown disgusted with the series of mistresses who had dominated Louis XV, and they looked forward to serving their new queen. In 1773, when Marie Antoinette publicly rode through the streets of Paris for the first time, applauding crowds swarmed around her carriage. How fortunate, she wrote her mother, to be in a position in which one can gain widespread affection at so little cost. In 1774, Louis XV died, and Louis XVI took the throne. As soon as Marie became queen, she abandoned herself to the pleasures she loved the most, ordering and wearing the most expensive gowns and jewelry in the realm, sporting the most elaborate hair in history, her sculpted coiffures rising as much as three feet above her head, and throwing a constant succession of masked balls and fets. All of these whims she paid for on credit, never concerning herself with the cost or who paid the bills. Marie Antoinette's greatest pleasure was the creation and designing of a private Garden of Eden at the Petit Trianon, a chateau on the grounds of Versailles with its own woods. The gardens at Petit Trianon were to be as natural as possible, including moss applied by hand to the trees and rocks. To heighten the pastoral effect, Marie employed peasant milkmaids to milk the finest-looking cows in the realm. Launderers and cheesemakers in special peasant outfits she helped design. Shepherds to tend sheep with silk ribbons around their necks. When the queen inspected the barns, she would watch her milkmaids squeezing milk into porcelain vases made at the royal ceramic works. To pass the time... Marie would gather flowers in the woods around the Petit Trianon or watch her good peasants doing their chores. The place became a separate world, its community limited to Marie's chosen favorites. With each new whim of Marie's, the cost of maintaining the Petit Trianon soared. Meanwhile, France itself was deteriorating. There was famine and widespread discontent. Even socially insulated courtiers seethed with resentment. The queen treated them like children. Only her favorites mattered, and these were becoming fewer and fewer. But Marie did not concern herself with this. Not once throughout her reign did she read a minister's report. Not once did she tour the provinces and rally the people to her side. Not once did she mingle among the Parisians or receive a delegation from them. She did none of these things because, as queen, she felt the people owed her their affection, and she was not required to love them in return. In 1784, the queen became embroiled in a scandal. As part of an elaborate swindle, the most expensive diamond necklace in Europe had been purchased under her name, and during the swindler's trial, her lavish lifestyle became public. People heard about the money she spent on jewels and dresses and masked dances. They gave her the nickname Madame Deficit, and from then on she became the focus of the people's growing resentment. 
When she appeared in her box at the opera, the audience greeted her with hisses. Even the court turned against her, for while she had been running up her huge expenditures, the country was headed for ruin. Five years later, in 1789, an unprecedented event took place, the beginning of the French Revolution. The queen did not worry. Let the people have their little rebellion, she seemed to think. It would soon quiet down, and she would be able to resume her life of pleasure. That year, the people marched on Versailles, forcing the royal family to quit the palace and take residence in Paris. This was a triumph for the rebels, but it offered the queen an opportunity to heal the wounds she had opened and establish contact with the people. The queen, however, had not learned her lesson. Not once would she leave the palace during her stay in Paris. Her subjects could rot in hell for all she cared. In 1792, the royal couple was moved from the palace to a prison as the revolution officially declared the end of the monarchy. The following year, Louis XVI was tried, found guilty, and guillotined. As Marie Antoinette awaited the same fate, hardly a soul came to her defense. Not one of her former friends in the court, not one of Europe's other monarchs, who, as members of their own country's royal families, had all the reason in the world to show that revolution did not pay. Not even her own family in Austria, including her brother, who now sat on the throne. She had become the world's pariah. In October of 1793, she finally knelt at the guillotine, unrepentant and defiant to the bitter end. Interpretation From early on, Marie Antoinette acquired the most dangerous of attitudes. As a young princess in Austria, she was endlessly flattered and cajoled. As the future queen of the French court, she was the center of everyone's attention. She never learned to charm or please other people, to become attuned to their individual psychologies. She never had to work to get her way, to use calculation or cunning or the arts of persuasion. And like everyone who was indulged from an early age, she evolved into a monster of insensitivity. Marie became the focus of an entire country's dissatisfaction because it is so infuriating to meet with a person who makes no effort to seduce you or attempt to persuade you, even if only for the purpose of deception. And do not imagine that she represents a bygone era or that she is even rare. Her type is today more common than ever. Such types live in their own bubble they seem to feel they are born kings and queens and that attention is owed them. They do not consider anyone else's nature, but bulldoze over people with the self-righteous arrogance of a Marie Antoinette. Pampered and indulged as children, as adults, they still believe that everything must come to them. Convinced of their own charm, they make no effort to charm, seduce, or gently persuade. In the realm of power, such attitudes are disastrous. At all times, you must attend to those around you, gauging their particular psychology, tailoring your words to what you know will entice and seduce them. This requires energy and art. The higher your station, the greater the need to remain attuned to the hearts and minds of those below you, creating a base of support to maintain you at the pinnacle. Without that base, your power will teeter, and at the slightest change of fortune, those below will gladly assist in your fall from grace. Keys to Power In the game of power, you are surrounded by people who have absolutely no reason to help you unless it is in their interest to do so. And if you have nothing to offer their self-interest, you are likely to make them hostile for they will see in you just one more competitor, one more waster of their time. Those that overcome this prevailing coldness are the ones who find the key that unlocks the stranger's heart and mind, seducing him into their corner, if necessary, softening them up for a punch. But most people never learn this side of the game. When they meet someone new, rather than stepping back and probing to see what makes this person unique, they talk about themselves, eager to impose their own willpower and prejudices. 
They argue, boast, and make a show of their power. They may not know it, but they are secretly creating an enemy, a resistor, because there is no more infuriating feeling than having your individuality ignored, your own psychology unacknowledged. It makes you feel lifeless and resentful. Remember, the key to persuasion is softening people up and breaking them down, gently. Seduce them with a two-pronged approach, work on their emotions, and play on their intellectual weaknesses. Be alert to both what separates them from everyone else, their individual psychology, and what they share with everyone else, their basic emotional responses. Aim at the primary emotions, love, hate, jealousy. Once you move their emotions, you have reduced their control, making them more vulnerable to persuasion. Mao Zedong always appealed to popular emotions and spoke in the simplest terms. Educated and well-read himself, in his speeches he used visceral metaphors, voicing the public's deepest anxieties and encouraging them to vent their frustrations in public meetings. Rather than arguing the practical aspects of a particular program, he would describe how it would affect them on the most primitive, down-to-earth level. Do not believe that this approach works only with the illiterate and unschooled. It works on one and all. All of us are mortal and face the same dreadful fate, and all of us share the desire for attachment and belonging. Stir up these emotions, and you captivate our hearts. Finally, learn to play the numbers game. The wider your support base, the stronger your power. Understanding that one alienated, disaffected soul can spark a blaze of discontent, Louis the Fourteenth made sure to endear himself to the lowest members of his staff. You, too, must constantly win over more allies on all levels. A time will inevitably come when you will need them. <laughs>